the Joe Rogan experience. But again, that goes back to like, you have an excuse all the time to do the wrong thing. You have an excuse all the time to go back to the familiar. You have an excuse all the time why to say the whole world is against you and be right. But so what? Now what? Now what are you going to do about it? How happy do you want to be? Your life will rise to the level you settle for and just to keep pushing. What did you do? How did you get out of it? Like, how did you, what was the first job that you got? When I was homeless? Yeah. Uh, I started, because I grew up singing. I was like, maybe I could get a gig somewhere and start singing because I made money singing, you know, like for my whole life since I was little, like a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, but whatever. So I'd go around to coffee shops um, in the area, but San Diego started to be a hotbed for signing activity, you know, grunge. There was like kind of a grunge scene in San Diego. And so I'd go in there and they, they charged you to sing there. I was like, this is mm. not ideal. Like, they wanted me to pay them two hundred dollars. I was really? like, really? Yeah. I was like, this is the For exact one gig. Yeah. And the, was the idea that you would sell tickets? They thought it was no. They thought it was like a signing. You would get signed. Oh god. You know what I mean? Because it became like so many record labels. I guess were coming down at the time. I remember this one lady. Like, my friend let me sit in on his gig. So I go sing with him. I'm starting to write my own songs. Oh, I forgot to tell you how I started writing songs back at school, but I'll tell you later. So I'll remember I, that. <laughs> so I started writing songs um, and singing my own stuff. I get on my friend's gig. He's packed the place out. I don't clearly, but he has it a, a crowded. There's like a door charge. So I go to settle out while he's taking his gear down. And this woman coffee shop owner was like, you guys don't get the door money. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like he brought all these people in. She's like, no. She goes, you get the tip jar. And I was like, oh, I was like, you know what, then why don't we get all your coffee and food money? You could just give us that instead. And she was like, you don't get the food and beverage money. You get the tip jar. And I was so upset. I needed the money so badly. Like, I didn't have food. You know, like, I was I was really wanting some money from that gig. And I remember I put my little finger in her face. And I was like, I am cursing you. Whoa. You are. I know. It sounded so heavy. I was like, you are stealing from the people that are giving you a living. You're stealing from this guy. And I was like, you are, you will go out of business. I was like, nobody can stay in business doing this to humans. I was so upset at her. And I. Did he have a understanding with her or was he I just guess getting robbed? I he didn't care. He just didn't care. I was so Fucking hippies. blown away. I was like. <laughs> He was, just wanted to be easy going and didn't want to make her mad and wanted to get another gig there. And I was just so upset. And so I found this place. I liked this little, when I was living in my car, there was a little tree that was flowering tree and I liked to park next to it. So like that was my home. And I noticed there was this coffee shop right there that was going out of business and it was really off the beaten path. And so I went in there and I talked to the lady who owned it. Her name was Nancy. And I was like, do you think you could stay open for two more months? And she's like, why? I'm like, if I bring people in, can I keep the door money? You can keep all the coffee and food. And like, we'll try and make it together. And Whoa. she said yes. And so I started going down on like the beach front in San Diego and I'd sing like street sing. And I'd tell people I'm singing at the interchange coffee shop on Thursday night at six o'clock. And two people came like it was two surfers that thought I was hot I think <laughs> <laughs> and I did a five-hour show because bar singing you do five-hour shows and I just thought I had to do a five-hour show so I started writing a ton of material plus I was using writing not to steal and I was a prolific thief so I had to become a <laughs> prolific writer <laughs> and so I did this five-hour show to these two guys I'm bleeding my heart out because I was so lonely and I realized I never tell the truth like nobody knows the truth I'm scared to death. I'm not a great person. I'm stealing. And I'm lonely. And I was like, maybe if I tell the truth, I won't feel so lonely. So I made a promise that I would write really honest songs. So these poor two surfers were subjected to five hours <laughs> of, like, bleeding out my, like, vocal cords. <laughs> it was amazing. I made $10. And uh, the next night, and I would go sing all throughout town on the street corner. I'd say, hey, Thursday night, they knew where to see me. And it just grew. It went from two people to four people to eight people to 40 to 80 to capacity to people standing outside watching me sing through the window. And I got discovered. Wow. Yeah. It was nuts. Wow. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> wow. What was that like? What was it? What was the feeling like when it was at capacity and you recognized that these people were, that something was changing 
in your life. These people are coming out to see you perform. The coolest thing and why I'm smiling is because I was changing. It moves me to tears right now. Like even before the people came, I felt a momentum shifting. You know, I just felt I was getting better. I was getting healthier. I was getting happier. My panic attacks, like I found out how not to have them. Like it just made me feel good. And then when these people came, I just bore my soul and I just didn't pull a punch. And they they liked me. And I know that sounds superficial, but it wasn't because it was so authentically me. I wasn't pretending to be better or more talented. It was so raw and people would cry and I would cry. And it was just such a real connection. Like for the first time in my life, I had a real meaningful human connection and it wasn't scary. It felt good. And they would give me books to read and they would give me food. And I didn't think it would lead to a record deal. It just felt like being fed for the first time in your life, you know, and not hiding and not being fake and just being really authentic. So it felt really good. And then when more people came, it just took on a momentum that was like, holy shit. How much like, time is passed from t the two people to people standing outside? You know, I don't know, but six months maybe ish, something like that. That's a lot of change in six months. Yeah, maybe a little more, eight months, but couldn't have been more than that because I don't think I was homeless more than a year. What was that? That change had to feel crazy. It was wild. <laughs> it was cool. And, you know, from like being on stage, but like I wouldn't make a set list and I would just feel the audience. And like I talked, and I did a lot of, I tell a lot of stories and like kind of like stand up. I would just tell like just stories and jokes and just shoot shit with people in the audience and they were just these really live electric like kind of wild shows and make them dead quiet and I would just take little breaks so people could use the bathroom and and when people started standing outside and they couldn't hear but they were just watching me through the window and the look on their face like to this day it like gives me chills like they looked at me with like a certain look and it was like holy shit like this is different and they would stand out in the rain, like we put little speakers out there so they could hear, and people would stand in the rain and just listen to me singing through the window with little speakers, and it was just like, it was very humbling, like very, very humbling. Wow. Yeah. So then what happens? How do you get discovered? There was a radio DJ, a programmer, excuse me, he ran 91X, which is a really big radio station in the country. They might have been number two in the country at the time, heavy alternative station. Uh, somebody told him about this girl singing in a coffee shop and that he should come. And he came in. I could recognize new faces when they come in because it was – this wasn't a big place, by the way. I mean, this might have been 70 people that could fit inside. That's a tiny coffee so shop. So you had developed a crowd. Like you, a yeah. you were accustomed to seeing familiar faces. Yeah, it was a loyal, diehard, diehard fan base. Like tiny. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I knew them. You know what I mean? It was, it was like a little family in a way. And so this guy came in. He had a goatee, a flannel shirt on. He looked kind of hard and he was sitting in the back and I remember singing the song a thousand miles away and he was just weeping like quietly but just tears were streaming down his face and he came up to me afterwards he's like hey I'm at the radio station and like why don't you come in like sing a song one night or something and I was like okay so I go in there still living in I'm oh I got another car so I had a car to live in um, I'd saved up enough door money to buy a car cheap car like a couple hundred dollar car um so I get down to the radio station and I sing a song for him and we talk a little bit and um, I guess he went ahead, him and this guy named Lou Niles, put it uh, on the radio, and it got requested um, by fans. That's back when you could still request songs and they'd listen to it. And it got somehow into the top 20, you know, of this station, which is a big deal. Like, top 20 on that station was like, you know, labels pay a lot of money to promote their artists to try and get them into the top 20. And this was like an acoustic guitar demo in the middle of like all this grunge music and so record labels were like how the what is this song that's showing up on this playlist and they would call him and he's like it's this chick down at this coffee shop and so all of a sudden there would be like these limousines pulling up <laughs> and they would give sweet little nancy you know that was just she was having a banging business now which felt so good and they would be like she'd be like jewel sony records is here tonight and i'd be like all right i was so passe about the whole thing it was very yeah. funny um, and then they'd take me out to tacos and talk to me about record deals. And, and then there was a bidding war. It was every label came down, every label. 
they'd flown from New York, they'd bring in bigger executives, then they'd fly in, they'd come again, they'd, you know, all these limousines showing up. And I would start to got flown around to talk to different record labels. And I How thought long I does should, this process take? I don't know. I am, I'm kind of bad with time that way. I don't know, a couple months, something like that. And you, you don't have a manager, you don't have anybody speaking for you. Mm-mm. No, but I went to the library and I found this book called <laughs> <laughs> How to Manage Yourself by, for Dummies. <laughs> it was Don Passenheim, I think, called Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business. Oh, boy. And that sounded good. So I read it and I just learned about mechanicals and royalties and back ends and advances. Oh, so you did your homework. I did my homework. And there ended up being a huge bidding war over me. Um, all the labels just started like competing. By this time, I kind of found like a de facto manager. Um, I maybe got a lawyer here at some point, you know, and this might now have taken more time. But I realized because of reading that book that an advance is a loan. You don't get to keep the money. You pay it back through record sales. And so I did the math to see how many records I'd have to sell to pay back a million dollars, and it was a lot of records. And so it was like having a bounty on my head as an artist. Um, I almost didn't sign my record deal because I had just figured out how to be happy, like genuinely. I was really starting to figure it out, and I knew it, like inside myself. I was doing so much better. And God forbid you take somebody with my emotional background and they ever get famous, I'm the recipe for every movie you've seen about every <laughs> musician. Like, right. And again, I didn't want to be a statistic, and I fought so hard for my happiness up to this point that I was like, I don't think I could trust myself to have a record deal and figure out how to do that career without self-imploding. So I almost didn't sign it. I remember being on the beach one day, and I was like, I wanted to do it, but I was terrified of doing it. So I made myself a promise that my number one job would still be to figure out how to be happy, and my number two job would be to be a musician. And then, under the musician category, that I wanted to be an artist more than I wanted to be famous. And so knowing those was like having my North Star, and I felt like I could navigate and make decisions based on those things. And so I went ahead and signed the record deal, I turned down the advance. I turned down a million dollar bonus. Holy shit. <laughs> As a homeless kid. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. That is so crazy. And I took the How biggest. How did you do that? That's, I would have taken that money for sure, 100%. I would have yeah. been like, I'll figure it out in the future. <laughs> Taking this money. I'm getting a fucking fat apartment overlooking the water. <laughs> this is not what I did. As a homeless kid, you passed on a million bucks. I did. Wow. But I took the biggest back end anybody had ever been awarded. And mm. so if I sold records, I was going to make a shit ton. So because like under the artist category, I wanted to be an artist more than I wanted to be famous. It meant I had to put myself in an environment and in a position to win as a singer songwriter and as a folk singer, no less, at the height of grunge. Mm. The odds of that working I knew were really slim, and I felt like the bidding war over me was just much more of like a dick contest between all the labels. I didn't think it necessarily had to do with my talent. I thought I was talented, but I thought the odds were still really, really against me. And I had to put myself in a position to be able to weather the fact that my first album may not be successful. But if you have a million dollar signing bonus, you have to have your first let record be successful or else you'll get dropped because you mm. cost so much to the label. And so I was just doing it to put myself in a position to make my art first and to not leverage my art unduly. You know, it's like saying you have to grow a pear, but you don't even have a tree yet. Mm. Like I had to grow a tree. Like the pear was a long way away. And so I just tried to look at it kind of agriculturally or in a natural system of like, I have to grow, I have to plant a seed. I have to like grow That's a tree, amazing. you know. Watch the entire episode for free only on Spotify.